My name's Steve uh, McAlpine. I was here last week with you guys, and uh, it's good to be back. Um, we have a Bible reading, um, which you will have on the screen. It's 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. I'll be using the NIV uh, for that reading. So I'll give you a minute, or you can look at the screen. One Corinthians 11. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment." And when I come, I will give further instructions. And wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly in the wall for those further instructions? Well, that's the passage we're looking at. You can imagine a whole bunch of you having a feast over there, a big party, and half of you over there uh, having bread and water. And uh, that's pretty much what was going on. How about we pray? And then we're going to look at this passage of the Bible because it is familiar in some senses. Like we looked at Haggai last week, and most people I think hadn't, couldn't find Haggai to begin with for a couple of minutes, but in the back of the Bible. But this passage gets trotted out at communion very regularly. But I want to dive into it and see what Paul is saying in this letter that he's writing to a church that he planted where there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on and uh, see what he is saying. So how about we pray and then we'll, uh, we'll have a look at this passage together and ask God to help us understand it. Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray that it will uh, showcase Jesus to us by the power of your spirit, as you promised to do, and that we will go from your word changed, and we will be like those who look into a mirror, walk away, and know what we were like, and so are transformed by that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if I lose my voice a bit today, I was at a wedding last night, till late. I think I changed clothes in the the transition somewhere between now when I got up this morning. Uh, So I'm a little bit croaky. And these lights last... I've got a hat. I might wear it so I don't get sunburned by the second time around because those lights last week. Anyway, I have... There we go. We're ready to go. Flying. Do you remember flying? Flying in a plane. Not flying. Flying in a plane. I remember flying vaguely because I did a lot of it last year and up until March this year when I got the last uh, plane out of Tasmania and it's been locked down ever since. But uh, last year I did a lot of trips and on Virgin flights, my favourite seat is 8C. I know where 8C is. I'm sort of step aside. I'm going straight to 8C. And I always book 8C because it's, it's the Goldilocks seat for me. It's not too far back. It's not too far forward. It's in the aisle for a 53-year-old person, you don't want to be getting out six or seven times during a five-hour flight to go to the toilet, these 53-year-old bladders. But flying, and the thing about flying uh, on a flight when you're at 8C is that uh, about 45 minutes into the flight when the uh, light goes off for uh, seatbelts, the attendant in the business class, the uh, 
the steward or stewardess comes out and they get a red rope and they put it across that section and they seal off, including the front toilet, which is probably my object of desire, um, they seal that off from everyone else uh, a few seats back or the rest of the... The red rope comes out and it puts a division between us in cattle class and those people in business class and those seats in business class that you had to walk past and look at enviously and go, look at all that leg room, um, as you went down the plane. And you know what? They love it that way. They love it. The plane, you know, they do that so that you think, next time, it's business class for me. They want to show you that there's a little bit of standard, there's a little bit of division. And they walk you past it deliberately on your way down to cattle class. And it burns me up, man. It really burns me up, those division things. I absolutely hate division. Except halfway through last year, I got a frequent flying Virgin Gold Pass to the lounge. And what does that mean when they announce boarding? It's like <laughs> they put another red rope out and you go, <laughs> you know, and you walk past looking at all those other people and you get into 8C and you just do that and there's luggage, you can see from, from space there's room to put your everything, just put a hat there and a coat there and a bag there and, you know, you make, you know, you make the best of that red rope. But red rope life doesn't just start on an aeroplane, does it? Those divisions, those ways of making ourselves feel better about ourselves, or worse, or making other people feel worse. It starts probably at school, doesn't it? In fact, it probably starts on the school bus where the back of the bus is actually the place that you want to sit. <laughs> That's the cool kids sit, or the school cafe. And you get the gold lounge seats in cinemas, and you have access all areas to gigs, and you have premium memberships which say, you're a little bit special. See, the point of the red rope is to make distinctions between people, to say, actually, we're not all on the same page here. Some of us are a little bit special. There's an in-crowd, and, well, there's everybody else, and you want to belong to the in-crowd and not the everybody else crowd. It's fantastic, isn't it? That's the way things operate. And the Christians in Corinth loved the red rope. The Christians in Corinth... Many of them were into what I call red rope Christianity. And in this passage today, that's exactly what they were practicing. Red rope Christianity. Where a red rope gets out and put across the aisle and said, you're the special guys and you're the not so special guys. And in this passage today, Paul says, I'm going to cut through that red rope. <laughs> The bloke who planted their church, who comes to them with the gospel of Jesus that says, Jesus has died for all. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, Jew and Gentile alike, rich, poor, male, female, slave, free, whatever, educated, not uneducated, intellectual, non-intellectual, impressive, unimpressive in Corinth. And he says, I'm writing this stuff to you and you're putting up a red rope. I'm hearing stuff that I don't like to hear. He does not like what is going on. Look at what he says. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, verse 17, for your meetings do more harm than good. Your meetings do more harm than good. Imagine if you were coming to church today and the minister up the front said, it's worse getting together than staying at home. That would be like security, get him out of here. That's, not, that's going to tank this thing. It's hard enough getting out of bed sometimes to come for 8.30, but there's the minister imploring you. It's actually worse to come here than it is to stay at home. And you're going right on, back in my pajamas, give me YouTube church again. Imagine a situation in which not getting together as God's community as a church could actually be a better option. What was so bad about getting together that Paul would say that? More harm than good. More harm than good. But Paul, we're singing absolutely amazing songs. We've got a great slogan on... Oh, we do have a great slogan on the wall too. Yeah, we've got a great slogan on the wall. We've got great prayers. And it's, a, it's a, an average sermon, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's getting there. Have you seen our Instagram page? We're amazing. And Paul says, more harm than good. More harm than good. What were they getting wrong? What was Paul so, shall we put it, ropeable about? <laughs> 
Well, he's ropeable about ropes, red ropes. He was ropeable about the red rope Christianity he was hearing about from the church in Corinth where people were being divided into categories based on things that they should not have been divided into categories about. What was going on? What was going on? Well, Paul goes on to say this. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it, And no doubt, there have to be divisions among you to show which of you have God's approval. Do you see the red rope? He said, there's divisions among you. I've heard of it. Someone's written to me and told me. You've been grassed up, people. Someone has written and said, this is what's happening among you. There are divisions among you. Now, at this point, you would want Paul to say, there should not be any divisions among you at all. But he doesn't say that, does he? He says, no doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. And they're going, yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. (laughs) That's exactly what we're saying. We want divisions to show that there's the super Christians here on the business class side of the red rope, and there's everybody else. But I don't think they get Paul. There have to be divisions among you to show which of you have God's approval. Here's the thing about division like that. Division is always about approval, (laughs) always about approval. Who's on the approved side and who's on the less approved or the disapproved side, and we do it ourselves. We do it when we're driving, don't we? Because we are amazing drivers. If I wasn't doing my job, I would be sort of like, teaching people to drive. (laughs) I seem to do it on the car all the time. (laughs) I'm on the right side of it. Everyone else is on the wrong side of it. But something about us loves distinctions between ourselves and other people that make us look better, as long as we're on the right side of them, as long as we're being approved by others and also by ourselves. Now, Canadian philosopher Andrew Potter has a book called The Authenticity Hoax, How We Got Lost finding ourselves. And he said, central to who we are in the modern age is that we seek sources of distinction between ourselves and other people in order to be approved by ourselves, but also by the watching crowd. And we can't help it. So he gives a great example of this source of distinction, where he talks about a a diet fad maybe 10, 15 years ago called the 100-mile diet. And the point of the 100-mile diet was that you would only source your food from 100 miles away. So you would get a smaller carbon footprint. You weren't traveling so far. It was a little bit hip, a little bit urban. Well, it can't be that urban because you've got to get food and it doesn't grow out of concrete. But 100-mile diet. And there was a book about it. And everyone was buying this book, 100-mile diet. And that was a source of distinction. You're walking around, well, I get all my food, everything I eat, sourced from within 100 miles of where I live. Until someone came up with what? The 50-mile diet, oh, you know, shred the 100-mile diet, buy the 50-mile diet. And it kept, you know, it's a battle of the, of the miles. Until eventually some bloke wrote the zero-mile diet where he grew all the food he needed on the apartment roof that he lived in. Except the cow. He had to go somewhere else. I think. The zero-mile diet. Because we look for sources of distinction. And then when we find those sources of distinction, we sort of worship them, we gild them, we make them the thing that separates us in a good way from other people. So Paul puts it out there. It's about approval, all right. It's about approval. But let's talk about who God approves of. Because here's the problem in Corinth. The rich, wealthy, influential, spiritually amazing people thought that they were the ones approved by God The ones who were doing well in society were the ones approved by God and everyone else was just a little bit down the back of the plane. The Corinthian Christians are convinced that the way God measures who's in and who's out, who's acceptable, who is not, who is approved, who is not, who is on the good side of the red rope and who is on the bad side of the red rope, is exactly the same way that the city of Corinth, the pagans who do not know Jesus, do it. The way they measure who is in, who is out, who is acceptable, who is not, who I could have a meal with, who I may not have a meal with. 
Corinth, the city, was the cool city. It was the hip urban place to be. And if you want credibility in Corinth, you're influential, you're an Instagrammer, you're cool, you're intellectual, and you're well-to-do. And the gospel comes to Corinth, and they go, why don't we just take that way of doing life and baptize it with a little bit of Jesus, and we'll keep doing it, and we get to heaven on the last day anyway. But we don't need to change our basic philosophy of life. They were modeling church just like that. And as you read the rest of the letter, that's exactly what it looks like. By the time you get to chapter 11, it's not some surprise that they're having red rope Christianity because they've been doing it all along. They had forgotten or never remembered in the first place this important distinction in the Bible that you can get from Genesis to Revelation very easily. That the things God approves of and the things that humans approve of are going in the opposite direction. Jesus says the things that humans value, God has no regard for. The scriptures say that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. It doesn't even say that God sort of ignores the proud. It says he actively opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Go through the whole story of the Bible. Everywhere God is making a distinction based on the exact opposite of what humans approve of. The story of 1 Samuel, the birth of Samuel, the prophet, Hannah's son. Hannah is barren. Her rival wife has lots of kids. The nation of Israel is broken, whereas the rich people and the powerful and the corrupt people are doing well, and God's law and God's people are being downtrodden. But when Hannah miraculously is about to give birth with Samuel, she has this amazing song where everyone on the wrong side of the rope is brought to the good side, and everyone on the good side is shoved down the back of the plane. The hungry, the poor, the childless, the needy, the weak are elevated. What does it say? Those who are full hide themselves out for food, but those who are hungry are hungry no more. 1 Samuel 2 verse 5. And that's not a one-off. That thread runs through the whole Bible that God elevates the poor and the humble and actively opposes the proud. Everyone that the red rope crowd despises, God elevates. God is the great role reverser in the Bible. The great role reversal from everything. Even with suffering and glory. The Bible says, suffer now, glory later. The flip side is, glory now, <laughs> fill in the blank. And here's the thing, the Corinthians are in danger of being opposed by God. He does not approve of what they're doing, even though they do. So then, when you come together, 1 Corinthians 11.20, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. It is not the Lord's Supper you eat. Now, let me just explain this a little bit. This is not talking necessarily about communion, the way we think of communion. Now, at the moment in COVID, we've gone from a loaf and everyone getting a little glass. I wanted a, like a big tankard that we could all share a couple of years ago. <laughs> I didn't predict COVID. Now we're down to le snack uh, communion, which is sort of like a little thing like that. You peel the top off, eat the wafer, and... you. Know, You've used up so much energy, you haven't got the energy left to peel off the next bit and drink it. But we do communion every week at Providence because we want to, at our church, because we want to keep that together. But it's not what it's saying here. It's, it's about a communal meal together that they're having, at which point they do celebrate Jesus' death and his body and his blood. But it's in the context of this meal as a church. But they've slipped into the Greco-Roman way of doing things because of these divisions, this red rope way of doing life. And in the Roman world and in Corinth, 
Whoever was the most approved, you could tell because of the seat at the table that they had. Who's on the right side of the red rope? And they were doing exactly like everyone else in pagan Corinth when they got together to meet around a meal with Jesus. Because remember, whenever they get together, whenever we get together, it's not as if Jesus is in our midst. Jesus is in our midst. (laughs) And in the rest of Corinth, you would go down, if you wanted to make a business deal with someone, if you want to socially engage with someone, if you wanted to grease a palm or find a way into a, a business thing or influence in the culture, you would get invited or invite people to a lordly supper, a lord's supper or a god's supper at one of the temples. And you would go down to the temple where the business deals were done and you would have a big table there and you would be sitting there and the people you most wanted to influence or most wanted to be around would sit around you and it it would go descending down like that. Paul talks about this in the chapters before this. The red rope was a thing in Corinth. Status, influence, those things got you somewhere. Grease my palm and I will help you out. I will get you to the right side of the red rope, like you're hanging out at a nightclub and you know the bouncer. (laughs) Now, it sounds like that's a bit crass, but here's how crass it got. Pliny the Younger, a lawyer in the early centuries of, uh, you know, back 2,000 years ago, uh, was a writer and a lawyer, and he wrote this about a well-off friend. The best dishes were set in front of himself and a select few and cheap scraps of food before the rest of the company. He even had the wine put into tiny little flasks divided into three categories, not with the idea of giving his guests the opportunity of choosing, but to make it impossible for them to refuse what they were given. One lot, the good lot, was intended for himself and us, another for his lesser friends, all his friends are graded. (laughs) I don't grade my friends, you grade your friends anyway. And, uh, And the third for all of the freed slaves. That's category right there. And how different does that really look to what's going on in Corinth? Verses 21 to 22. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. They're damning words, aren't they? He's saying you're doing exactly what pagan Corinth does. You're living red rope Christianity when Jesus came to take the red rope away. Jesus died to take the red rope down to create one new humanity between rich and poor, Gentile and Jew, slave and free, influential and nobodies. And all you've done is say, I'll just get that rope and we'll stitch it back together and we'll do exactly like Corinth does. Because if Corinth looks at us and sees something radical, they're not going to like it. This might as well, says Paul, be a lordly supper to a pagan god in a temple because the divisions you have are disgracing people just like that did and they're disgraceful to God. Now, we talked a lot about the red rope Christianity and these divisions, but can I just point out at this point that the red rope Christianity that they're engaging in isn't the problem? Haven't I just said that it is? No, it's the symptom of the problem. It's the symptom of the problem. And what's the problem? They've forgotten the gospel. They've forgotten the gospel. And it's bleeding into every area of their lives. And if you read the letter, they've forgotten the gospel, so humility now looks like pride. They've forgotten the gospel, so purity now looks like sexual sin. They've forgotten the gospel, so unity now looks like division. They've forgotten the gospel, so that forgiveness now looks like going to court against another Christian. The gospel way of doing life is not on their radar. The pagan Corinthian way is, and it's just expressing itself when they get together for a meal. So it's the symptom of a deeper problem Because here's the thing, you go, I don't care who I eat with, 
I go down to the food hall and as long as the guy besides me got deodorant on, had a shower in the last three days, I'm okay. Uh, except for COVID, of course. But the question we had to ask ourselves is, when we get together, what is it we are not doing that should be reflecting what Jesus is like? What are we doing that is more pagan than Christian? It could be red rope Christianity. It could be divisions among the influential and the non-influential or the in-crowd and the non-in-crowd or the cool and the uncool in your church, the people who I look good with, the people who aren't a drain on my time. <laughs> but it could be other stuff, couldn't it? What way are we living that just reflects a pagan Corinth? The lack of forgiveness, perhaps, between people in the church. You see, this is a big enough building. If someone could sit on that corner and someone could sit in that corner and they've got a problem with each other and never have to resolve it. Never have to talk to each other again. Could come in and could go out for a year and never speak to each other. Do you think Jesus goes, oh, that's okay. <laughs> it's a big enough building. <laughs> or sexual sin. Goodness knows we see enough of that among Christian leadership in our newspapers, magazines and online. It leeches its way into every era of life. Or what about living individualistic, self-focused lives where my primary goal is to do Project Me? <laughs> you do you. <laughs> I'll do me. You do you. In Corinth, separate meals is the presenting issue. For us, it might be something completely different. There are lots of ways to do it. But at the heart of it is this. If we're thinking more like pagan Perth in the way we do things than redeemed by Jesus Perth, then we're just doing red rope Christianity some other way, some other way. So what's the solution? Is there one? Not just to the symptoms. I don't know your church well enough really to know if it's red rope Christianity or something else. But Paul starts to unpack it because he then goes into what they're doing when they share the bread and the cup together. So they've had this meal and they break bread and Paul there describes, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, verse 23. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, which is why we use one loaf, Paul says. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he takes the cup and says, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, the new promise of God to change you from within. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we use this at communion so often. I think what happens by the time you get to the end of communion, you've got your little shot glass in your hands, ready to slam it on the table, you toast Jesus till he comes, and then bang, over, done. But Paul's not saying that. He's saying, until the day Jesus comes back, every time you do this, you're proclaiming that he was on the wrong side of the red rope. You proclaim Jesus' death. And the thing about the Corinthian church, they didn't like that idea because it was a bit icky. It looked a bit naff. They wanted to be resurrection people already. <laughs> they wanted the power now. They wanted the influence now. They wanted glory now. And Paul says, no. You get together, you proclaim Jesus' death, that death outside the city, that death where people were spitting, scorning, crucifying, mocking. That's what you're proclaiming because you're those people. If you want to be Jesus' people, you're those people on that side with him. Jesus was completely on the wrong side of the red rope. He wasn't even on the wrong side of the red rope in the plane. He got chucked off the plane for us. Judged for us. Determined to be a non-influencer by the culture for us. And Paul says you cannot proclaim his death in that 
and act like this. That is hypocrisy. His death flies in the face of your proud red rope divisions. And that is true of anything. You cannot proclaim his death until he comes and harbour sin. And harbour sin. It's an insult to his death. And if you keep doing it, says Paul, I'm going to be really sad. No, he doesn't say that actually. Uh, What does Paul go on to say? Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep, and I don't think he means a long sermon made you nod off. Which body of Christ are they not discerning? The bread? The drink? No, because he'll go on to talk about this in a few chapter. The body of Christ. When you go, step aside, people, I'm getting to my meal, you are not discerning the people of God. Not discerning them. And Paul says, watch out. You go, but, but my theology is right. I know that Jesus died for our sins and we're free from all that and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, you've eaten and drunk judgment on yourselves and some of you have died. Some of you have died. That is a scary thought. And he goes on to say this. When we are judged in this way by the Lord, verse 32, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. This is not easy stuff to hear, but it is saying this. When the church gets disciplined like that, it's for the purpose that on the last day they do not hear, depart from me. That's sobering, super sobering. And Paul says to us, God says to us through these words today, if we behave in the ways that do not discern the body, that does not discern who God's people are, what Christ has done to save us, if you bring sin into the camp, watch out, watch out. So, you know, what are you saying here, Paul? (laughs) Finish my theological theological conundrum here. No, he says, just watch out. Just watch out. I think that's warning enough, isn't it? Do I need to explain how... No, just watch out. Just be careful. We serve a holy God. Let's be careful. In a world where we're divided, where we actually like distinctions where our own psyche says, I want to be approved of by some and I want to shun others. That's our default until the gospel transforms us. What's the solution? I actually mentioned this verse last week in Haggai. Hebrews 13. Because Paul says this, So then my brothers and sisters, verse 33, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And here's the only way you can do that. If you're totally and utterly convinced that to stand with Jesus stands you with those who are shamed now, who are not glorified now. Because in the long run, there will be glory and honour. And it says in Hebrews 13, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. Anyone for bearing disgrace today? Anyone? For here we do not have an enduring city like Perth or Corinth, but we are looking for a city that is to come. Can you suffer and identify with the people of God now for the sake of glory later when Jesus says well done good and faithful servant can you put sexual sin aside or individualism aside or pride or your own goals aside for the sake of blessed are those who mourn now for they will be comforted go to the other side of the red rope this is saying the side of the red rope where Jesus was outside the city outside with the outcasts outside with the unimpressive The one who suffers now will receive glory later. The hungry who God will feed, the humble who God will lift up, the poor who God will enrich, the holy who God will honour. 
and the last will be second, first, in the city where Jesus will sit us down at a table <laughs> with no red rope and feed us with his goodness forever. How about I pray? Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you look after us. We thank you that you give us a timely word that's hard to hear. But we pray that we'll put it into practice in our lives. Give us this day our daily bread of your spiritual food that we might be transformed by your word in all we do. In Jesus' name.